church at Sun Valley. Let's bless the name of the Lord together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to grace. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me. When the world's all out. It should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out Closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Bless you. Lord, we praise you. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Just 
Redemption's Church at Sun Valley and friends, we're so glad that you are listening, whatever time that is, whether evening or morning. I really only have one announcement today. It's, it's concerning our reopening of our service in person. We have heard from many of you, and we know that the COVID, the COVID tolerance of everyone is, is in uh, very different places. And so we took a bunch of emails and had conversations, and the elders prayed and thought through what the best way to do this would be. And before I get to that, I really want to encourage you that in Romans 14, Paul kind of dealt with uh, issues of different ideas about how things should be done, what, how uh, things should be eaten, what things should be eaten and when. And in that, his main principle was we should remain unified. And so in all of this, as we're trying to figure out how best to get back together, I want us as a body to focus on remaining unified. The enemy only wins when we get in such disagreement that it makes us angry and we lash out. So for us currently, our, our first step is we're going to meet next Sunday in our regular time and, and space at the gym. And part of the reason why we're doing that is in order to include as many people as possible, the elders have decided to purchase a, a different camera and some equipment so that we can do live processing live videos so those who wouldn't be able to come to any type of service will at least be able to watch it at the same time and that's our hope for next week starting next week we looked at outside but of course we wouldn't be able to do that online video out there we also would all die and melt at this current time of the season we we're asking we will have some guidelines that will be attached to the email that i send out but some of those will be, we're asking everyone to wear a mask except if you're on stage. But even if you're on stage, if you go down to, to have a mask on, we'll obviously have the chairs spread out. If they're not family, we want everybody six feet apart. So we know many of you, if you have a high tolerance, the idea of wearing a mask and, and some of these other things may seem trivial. But we also want to invite as many of those who might have a lower COVID tolerance to be able to come and not feel that they are being taken advantage of. So I look forward to seeing as many of you who are able to make it. This does not mean that we won't do anything different in the future, but this is how we're going to start off. Now, I wanna to go to our scripture, our community scripture together, and we're gonna look at Psalms chapter 40, verses nine through 17. And here David is, as last week we talked about justice and the idea that uh, of fairness. And here David is, is talking about justice. And also we see the troubles that are going on in our world. And here David cries out in the troubles that surround him. Will you read with me Psalms 40 verses 9 through 17? I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, O Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame. For they said, aha, we've got him now. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my savior. Oh my God, do not delay. Will you pray together with me today? Oh God of tender, loving mercies. It is easy to become distressed seeing our world. 
The powerful take advantage of the weak. Injustice seems to go on unending and our own fear keeps us from responding. Yet you, Lord, are just. Nothing is hidden from your sight. Right and wrong are yours to declare. At the same time, we cry out for mercy. Mercy for ourselves and loving kindness to abound. We know Christ is the conduit of your mercies. And because of his kindness, we are free. May we see our neighbors and love them as ourselves. In faith, we trust you now and in the future. We have no hope apart from you. We have many who are sick and hurting. Lord, heal them and bring comfort. Help us see where we can show your kindness to them and help carry their burdens. Lord, move us as a body of believers to be active for justice and mercy and humility, not thinking first of our needs, but maintaining our integrity and being your light. Amen. Amen. Our God is great. Let's sing about him together and worship him. The splendor of a king. The splendor of the king. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Dark tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God all will see how great how great is our God
address her voices. How great is our God? sing about the goodness of God together.
Church, let's pray together at this time. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, we just thank you for your loving kindness and for your forgiveness, Lord, and for your never-ending, unceasing, and undying love. Father, we just pray that anything that we have that gets in a way that keeps us from you, Lord, whether it be greed or anger or, or, or anything, Lord, that whatever we are upset about, Lord, whatever, whatever gets in the way, whatever obstacle it is, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that we would die to these things, Lord, so that we can focus on you, Lord, and to follow you, to follow in your ways, Lord, and to follow and to, and to uh, be the, 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 the children that you want us to be, Father. Lord, uh, we just pray right now that uh, we can decrease so you can increase. And I just pray that, um, that uh, we prepare our eyes and, and, and our ears, Lord, and our minds to receive Pastor Daniel's message today. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. So church, most of you know that I love to play games. Now growing up, I never really played games for fun. We played games to win. It was always about winning. And so as I got older and I began to play other games, of course, I was always trying to win. In fact, sadly enough, I've passed this on to my kids at one point as they were young and we would play games that took strategy. And of course they were younger, so they didn't have the same strategy. And so normally I would win and I instituted a thing called a winner's dance where I would jig around and talk, you know, give them a hard time that I won. Uh, it wasn't long after that when all my kids began, when they would win, to do the same thing. So if they're at your house and they win a game, expect to dance. But really, with that, I loved to win. And so in college, a new game came out, and the game was called Jenga. Now, this is a game I didn't really understand how you won. It, there was 54 little blocks. If you don't know what Jenga is, maybe you lived in a cave. But it's this game where there's 54 little blocks and each, each level has three little blocks and they're built on top of each other in a perfect kind of rectangle. And the goal is you, you push out a block somewhere and then you put it back on top. And the winner is the person who is the last person to successfully do it before the person next knocks it over. Now, what I realized was the real strategy is to look for the person with the biggest fingers and the shakiest hands and go right before them. It wasn't about being good at engineering or trying to figure out. You just needed the person after you to be really bad at that thing. Now, I bring that up because when you looked at Jenga as you made it go higher and higher, you begin to see more holes. And as it got higher, it got shakier. You'd see it kind of sway sometimes, and you just knew the next thing might be the thing that knocks it over. And then when it splashed the ground, the object you had to do is completely clear it out and rebuild. You know, I use that as an analogy because for many years now, and especially right now, it feels like our world, if looked at as Jenga, has holes in it. It's barely upright and it's starting to sway. In fact, many of us have probably felt like recently that it's completely knocked down and it's just laying there in a, a pile of blocks. And, and I think about those things because as I grew up, even as a young man, I can remember people in my church praying, come Lord Jesus, come. And many, for many of us, that might be the prayer that we are praying in the midst of this time and in the midst of this world that seems to be so wrong. And, and I, I can remember that when we would get to Jesus's prayer and we would read in Matthew chapter six, verses nine through 10, where Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he said, this then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When I would read that and I would hear all these people around me praying that the Lord would come, I used to think that when it says your kingdom come, your will be done, that we were praying for the eternal kingdom to be set up. But that's not what Christ is praying here. 
what Christ is teaching his disciples to pray is that his kingdom of grace would come upon a fallen world. That in the midst of a shaky foundation and holes all in it, and it feels like it's swaying, that his kingdom would come and make a difference. And we know his kingdom did come when he died on the cross and rose again. And from that, he became the conduit of this kingdom. And, and through him, the kingdom grows when, when we continue to spread his word, when people become uh, people of faith, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become a part of the kingdom. And as we go about serving him and living life, that we become part of his will to come to earth. And that's kind of what we talked about last week when we talked about the agency of man. That when we become a part of this kingdom and when we pray that his will be done, we also understand that we are acting as agents on his behalf. That the, the theology of agency, and you can go back, if you hadn't had a chance to watch last week's sermon, you can maybe better understand the idea, but it's simply that God in his preordained wisdom determined that the way he wanted to do many of the things on earth was through man. That the same ones who messed it up, the same ones who had poked holes, the same one who had caused such a fall in our earth and in, in our culture, he was going to use, in fact, all humanity, but in particular, his followers to be his agents. His agents to bring his kingdom into fullness and to see his will done. And last week, we talked about specifically that we were gonna trust God as his agents in justice. If you remember, we, we went to Micah chapter six, verse eight, and it, this is written, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We talked about that there's two kinds of, of justice when we hear justice in the Bible. One is the idea of a judge judging right or wrong, but in this case, it's justice as in fairness. It's the idea of the powerful not using their advantage over the weak. It's the call on us to act justly ourselves, that in our relationships and how we use the power and influence and advantage that God gives us, that we don't use it to hurt people or to put other people at a disadvantage. But we also saw in, in the scripture last week that not only are we called to act justly, but we are called to seek justice for those who are oppressed. You know, I don't think I foresaw what would happen this week, but we've seen a lot of the word justice and fairness when you look at the video from Minnesota and you see an injustice so clear. And, and we understand that we're not just called to act justly, but to seek justice. And in that, we are part of agents to bring justice to this world in God's, on God's behalf. But today I want to talk about the second part of this verse, another way in which we are an agent, not only of his justice, but if you look there, it says to love mercy. We are called to be agents of his mercy. Now, mercy is also used two different ways. And probably the way you most, if you read the Bible and you maybe go to church, the way you've most heard the use of mercy is in the context of God's mercy for us in that we were all sinners and justice from a judgment's sake said we deserved death because of that. But Christ died on our behalf and through faith, we can take his death as the payment for ours and we receive God's mercy, meaning we don't have to experience or the deserved judgment. But that's not the mercy that this is talking about. Just like the justice isn't that kind of justice, this mercy actually is a word that is most often used as kindness, hesed 
is the Hebrew word. And it's, it's not like the kindness that my mom would always say is like, oh, be kind. It's not be nice. It is an actual acts of kindness. Go be kind, go do mercy for those. And specifically people who are in need or people who are hurting or people with whom you have power to help. Those are the people we act on mercy. And so it says love, mercy, love the kindness, love good acts. It's the idea that we are called to be agents of his kindness to the world. Yes, we should be just in our actions. Yes, we should seek justice for others. But even within that, we should also do acts of kindness to those who need our help. You know, we see this in a, uh, in a parable, one of the most famous parables that we see in the New Testament and we talk about, and it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, I want us to look at this parable really quickly. Because here Jesus really describes what this kindness or mercy looks like. And so we read, starting in verses 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now I wanna stop here for just a second because it would be easy for us to, to look at the very first question and the expert of the law says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And and then he answers, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus affirms, yes, that will be what you need to get to eternity. And we could go, wait a minute. I thought what we needed to get to eternity was put our faith in Jesus Christ. Exactly. What Jesus is saying is you cannot live the law perfectly. That basically what what. In verse 27, we read, love the Lord with all your heart. And when we read, love your neighbors as yourself, Jesus had said earlier that that's the summation of all the law. And guess what? None of us can live the law perfectly. In fact, if you look the very verse in 29, you see the teacher of the law, it says, and he wanted to justify himself. You know why he wanted that? Because his conscience convicted him. He knew that he had not kept this law that he needed to keep to inherit eternal life. He knew, and so he asked Jesus, because obviously the point of conviction was, maybe I haven't loved my neighbor as myself. So the question was, is, well, Jesus, who do you consider my neighbor? Maybe if we can get to just a small amount, I'll be able to confirm myself I, I'm okay. And Jesus replied this parable, in, starting in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he took, put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? I want to stop right there and think about the three people that Jesus described. Now, it's easy to look, and Jesus used specifically the first two are religious leaders. Now, when he looks at the priest, we can kind of infer some things, but at the same time, we don't know exactly why 
the priest, when he saw the man, that he had no, what we might look at it, no compassion. But at the same time, we have to understand that, that this priest, maybe he thought the man was dead. I mean, the, the beating that he took could have, could have left him unconscious. And to understand that for a priest, they weren't allowed to touch dead bodies. Not only that, if they were even around a dead body, they had to cleanse themselves for seven days. And so in some ways, maybe the priest never even went over there, just assumed that he was dead and didn't want any part of that. At the same time, we see a Levite, we see another religious leader. And here, once again, is one who, now he wasn't necessarily not allowed to ever touch a dead body other than his family. But, but once again, if he got around a dead body or did touch a dead body, he would have to be cleansed. And, and cleansing was a seven-day process. And, and to do the work that they were to, to do, it, it would take them away from it. And, and so that's not an excuse, but it could be some of the reason. But you look and he even got, it says, he, he kind of got close and then went around. So perhaps he even knew the man was not yet dead, but considered the fact that if he was touching him and he died, something would happen. But either way, there was no compassion that led them to do anything. Their mind was on the law. If you think about it, it was the law, either the religious law or the ceremonial law, and trying to do that, that they took advantage of the situation. They used the law as a reason not to be compassionate or kind, not to show kindnesses. And then we see in verse 33, but a Samaritan. Now, if you don't understand the relationship between a Jew and Samar a Samaritan, you might understand how incredible this might be. For if you want to talk about differences and things that would make people come apart, in our day and age, we, we seem to have gotten to a point where on a political standpoint, so many are, are so far over here and so many are so far over here and they can't understand each other. And there's a, a, a real idea that the other person is the enemy. Well, this was going on here as well because of what happened when the Jews were taken in, into other countries and were sent away. When they came back and the Samaritans had not been sent away, which they were Jews of an area originally and they had begun to even intermarry, that, that there was a political dis divide not only that, there was a religious divide. How they worshipped the same God, the Samaritans worshipped differently, and then they kind of had added, because of their intermarriage, had added other gods. So there's this religious strife. And then there was not only that, but there was just pure racism. The Jews did not look at the Samaritans as real Jews. Even though most scholars believe that the lineage of both were probably pretty similar after the Jews had been sent away, that and then come back. But the Jews looked on the Samaritans as not really a part of them. Does this sound familiar at all in our culture? And so Jesus is basically using someone saying, this guy had no reason to help. Everything that we would take as that guy's my enemy, hey, I didn't do it, but if he dies, it's not on me. And we see that instead, what did the Samaritan do? First, it says, he took pity on him. Now, that word pity is actually a, a sense of an emotional compassion. It overwhelmed him emotionally. But you know what? That's often where we as Christians, we stop. We see something or, or we're, we're confronted with something and initially it moves our hearts, but that's where it ends. We're not, we're not willing sometimes to go into and actually do acts of kindness or to get involved. We feel bad, but other things change our mind. I mean, I, I think about even what we witness in Minnesota and sometimes I see people and, and initially they watch that same video and there's a sense of compassion, but immediately they go, oh, but, but then there was other injustices and they just stop and they look away and they say enough. And, and there's no idea of kindness towards others. We, we separate and divide ourselves. Yes, injustices 
everywhere are wrong. But sometimes we use one injustice to make a, a reason why we can't be a part of kindness for people or take part in things because, hey, you know what? I have a good reason. But here, it went beyond a feeling of compassion. It says in 34 and 35, it cost him something. Remember what we talked about with justice? Why do we say trusting God as his agent of justice? Because when we trust God, we know that justice at some times might cost us something. That, that helping others, be, being just on our own might cost us something because we could take advantage of somebody. And seeking justice for others could cost us something, our reputation, our resources, our time. In the same way, being an agent of kindness costs something at times. Here he is, and he's bandaging wounds. He's pouring on oil and wine. Those cost money. He hands the innkeeper money to take care. But not only that, think about it. He was on his way somewhere. It was a distraction to sit and bind up this man, put him on the donkey, and head somewhere different than where he was going. And we know he wasn't going to the end because he, as soon as he could, he, he left. Cost him time, cost him resources, and might have cost him reputation. I mean, can you imagine if other Samaritans knew that he had helped the enemy? And then you see, and we finish in verse 37. Well, well, we'll start in verse 36 again. Jesus asked the expert of the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, we're called to be agents of God's kindness. Not just, not just feeling compassion, but actually doing things for those who are in need and those who are hurt. In fact, we know this because this is the very character of God. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Moses writes this about God. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. So there he's a God of justice. And then it says, and he loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. That God gives acts of kindness, even in the foreigner. In fact, he often used and called on the Israelites to give acts of kindness to the foreigners in their midst. And the reason why he said so is because he reminds them that you were once foreigners. He says, remember when you were in Egypt and you were a foreigner. Take that and remember those who come into your midst and and I am a God of kindness and you also be agents of kindness. Now I want you to think about those of us who are part of the current kingdom of God. We are citizens, not of this world, but of his kingdom. And as we are, there are so many around us who are yet foreigners to that kingdom. And the question is not only should we be kind to our fellow citizens, but we should be kind to the foreigner, to those in our midst who have not yet come to be a part of this kingdom. And we do it because once we were the foreigner, at one time, every one of us was not a part yet a part of this kingdom. We were not yet citizens. And for that, we should be kind to those around us. You know, we see over and over again in scripture where Jesus he was moved by compassion and then he acted, whether he healed or he provided sustenance. He was moved by compassion and then acted in kindness. And part of that, we have to trust. Oftentimes our, our thought is, well, if I do something small in kindness or if I act in kindness, how do I know it's really going to make a difference? And in that, that's where we trust God as agents of his kindness we might not always see the end result. 
But God says when we act in kindness, that this world and his kingdom gets more and that his will is done. We don't just pray for his will. We are a part of his will when we act as agents. You know, last week I was talking a little bit about some of the things that we have done as a community of believers in acts of, of justice and kindness. In particular, I mentioned um, the, the students who um, had been given free lunches and, and, and reduced lunches at school. And when we went to a four-day school uh, week, that some people, some of these kids were being given food on the weekends. And we were a part of that. We were helping them be able to have breakfast and lunch and snacks on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We were giving it to them. And we actually had received the, the principal passed on a, a comment this week. And obviously one of those parents wrote this, can you be so kind and pass along our great appreciation for the weekend boxes that the boys received. The boys truly love them and look forward to them every week. The contents are always a surprise and filled with the things the budget doesn't allow. Thank you so very, very much. You know, to be honest, we've become cynics. We, we look at people maybe who are on the side of the road or we think about even these boxes and we go, does it matter? Or what if they take advantage of it? Do they really need it? I can remember in my own heart when I, when I really became a cynic, I was watching the news in the DFW area and the news was doing a, a report on a guy who was a regular panhandler down in Dallas. And they found out that when he would get up from his panhandling, he'd go around to a parking garage a little bit away and he'd drive off in a, a, a nice car. And, and when they finally interviewed him, he kind of chuckled and admitted that, he had been panhandling because at that time it was probably, you know, obviously more than, than it was now, but it was $32,000 of tax-free money that he made a year just by sitting and collecting. And I remember even then as my thought is, is, well, how can I trust that the person who's on the side is really in need? You know, even as, as the elders and as we talk about from our benevolence committee, when we're trying to decide, well, who do we help? As we move forward beyond just those kids in need, what if there's families in our neighborhood who are in need? And it's so hard to become cynical and say, what if they don't really need? What if they take advantage of us? And although there's a wisdom in making sure we're not just um, being taken advantage of, there's also a cynicism that can easily take over where we deny kindness overall because we make excuses that, well, how do we know it matters? That's where we trust God. We trust God that we don't know everybody's motives. We don't know what everybody's doing with, all, with food or the money that, that we may help with. We'll never know for sure, but we can trust God that if our motives are right, if we do try to be good stewards and we do it for his name, that his name will be glorified and his will will be done. And his kingdom will expand because that's what he's about. You know, I think about, even, even as we think about building a church, a building, not the church, but, but a church building. And, and, and sometimes as a pastor, it's so easy to start thinking in terms of how can I grow the church, you know, so, so we can fill the building and instead of, how can I please my Lord and Savior? It's so easy to get our priorities misaligned. The question we should ask is not how does it affect us or me personally or the church as a whole? Like if I give kindness, is that gonna get somebody to, to come to church or is that gonna, suddenly are they gonna bow their knee to the Lord? I don't know, but what I do know is if we do it in his name, it matters. And that's enough. You know, God really dealt with me of my cynicism um, about some of the people who were on the corner and were asking for money. I, I remember the Lord just laying on my heart for me personally and, and, and that I needed to stop worrying about what they were gonna do with the money. 
that if he laid on my heart a feeling of compassion, that it was time to act. And, and so I, start, I, I came up with a plan that the Lord, I feel like, blessed. And for me, it was when I saw somebody that was there and, and had a sign for need and, and the traffic, I wasn't going to cause a problem with traffic or anything, that, that I, if I had cash, I'd give it. And so I've practiced that. And, and rather than spending, you know, a, a ton of time every time going, well, Lord, is this one? I just try to be generous and, and kind to all with the thought that whatever that person does with it, it, it is their then conviction or, 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 or their accountability to the Lord and not mine. And as I've done that, my kids have kind of watched this and my girls in particular, and they've become uh, my accountability that uh, they see somebody and they're like, dad, there's somebody, dad, there's somebody. And, and I remember, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, but that means I have to get out of the way and go somewhere else. But they're so um, compassionate. They see, but I remember one particular time they called out, they said, dad, there, there's, there's a lady there with their, her child in, on the corner. And I looked and in my wallet, I didn't have any cash at the time. And I said, well, I don't have any cash. And my daughter goes, I do. And she took out all she had, which was like three or $4. And she handed it to the lady. You know, that made me more proud than most anything that, that they had done. They'd probably been fighting in the back right before then. But the reality is they saw with compassion, but they didn't just see, they acted. And it cost them something probably more than my cash ever really cost me. My question for you personally and for us as a church is how are we going to be agents of kindness in our neighborhood? You know what? It's not hard for us to ask the question, who is my neighbor? That's easy for us in this community. Now, obviously, Jesus was saying everyone, but for us specifically, we know who our neighbors are. And I, I wanna continue to challenge you to think about how can you, you be kind to your neighbor? Maybe even the one that gives you bad look, who's turned you into the HOA and who you know, has, has maybe spoke to you in a way that, that wasn't respectful. Maybe you still smile and you say hi and that's kindness alone that you're showing in Jesus' name. And maybe it's an act of, of helping a neighbor who's sick or who's in need and maybe as I challenged last week, maybe you have not yet used your stimulus income and for you it was just extra money. There was no need there. And maybe you can give that to the new benevolence fund we started off for, for the people in our neighborhood who will be affected more and more. We know there are those who are still losing their jobs. And there are those as we go into the next fall and even this summer who, who kids who still need food. And as we look to continue that program, maybe you can give to be a part of that. But whatever it is, don't settle for the feeling of pity or compassion. Move into being an agent of God's kindness. Will you pray with me? Father, we're thankful that first you save us when we put our faith in Christ. But God, you don't leave it there. You choose through the Holy Spirit to change us. In fact, Lord, one of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. And Father, we are called to be agents of yours in justice and, and this week in kindness. May we grow in our kindness towards others. May we look around us and see where there are needs and go in and invest our time, our reputation, our resources in a way to produce and give away kindness. And then Lord, we trust you with it. It may not always lead to a direct advancement as far as bringing new people into your kingdom. It may not all, we may not always be able to see a, a, a person who suddenly begins to like us for our kindness. But God, we trust that you will use it for your purposes and for your glory. And that more than anything, Lord, we do it because it pleases you. In Christ's name, amen. 
While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate act of kindness. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. church. Be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ. And we're so excited to see many of you next week. Take care. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so
Your joker, Jimmy.